candidate at UMass Amherst. I work in the Climate System Research Center. Before that, I was an applied mathematician. Um, so let me get this. Okay, so there should also be closed captioning on this happening live in case it gets difficult to hear. You might be able to read the words that I'm saying um, as well. So, it's nice to meet you all. Um, like you said, I work on global climate models. Um, my research focuses on simulating future climate responses to changes in the Antarctic ice sheet. So as the Antarctic ice sheet begins to melt and all that meltwater is entering the ocean, that has a lot of implications for heat transport, ocean circulation, and things of that nature. So that is what I work on. Um, so the IPCC and the reports. My presentation is in two parts. The first part is going over the UN Special Report, and then the second part will be talking a little bit about climate projections for Massachusetts, um, focusing in on Franklin County, and a little bit about um, policy and what to do to sort of counter this crisis that we're all living through. So the IPCC is the UN body. Uh, yes? I think it's. Also, the captions are. Yeah, the captions. There we go. Uh, yeah. uh, is there somewhere we can. Uh, yeah, we can find it. <laughs> is in charge of um, disseminating climate change information. The IPCC itself does not conduct research, but it is comprised of scientists from all over the world, and what they do is synthesize the body of peer-reviewed research. Um, so they release several reports, and the reports fall under either assessment reports or special reports. The assessment reports are to state the current um, research into climate science, and those come out approximately every six years. The last one came out in 2014. The next one is actually due a little bit later than six years. It's coming in um, 2022. And then in the intervening time, because a lot can happen um, as far as research within those intervening years, they're currently producing a series of special reports, and the first of those three special reports is what came out in the fall and got um, all of that attention. Um, and so that's what I'll focus on returning to that in a minute. So the Paris Agreement is the current international agreement to combat climate change. And this, um, this was um, put together in December 2015 at a conference of the parties meeting 21. Um, and so the goal of that is to limit the degree of warming on um, the global average temperature to two degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial baseline. So a two degree increase above what the global mean temperature was before we started emitting a ton of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. But there's a reach goal in the Paris Agreement, and that is to limit the warming to one and a half degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial <coughs> average. And this was a real sticking point, especially for small island nations, because the difference between one and a half and two degrees is actually, um, climatically speaking, quite large, even though the number sounds pretty small. So what's actually in the special report? Um, the contents of it, um, it consists of five different chapters um, on assessing what one and a half degrees Celsius means, talking about the differences that we're gonna see in a one and a half degree world um, versus in a two degree Celsius um, warm world above pre-industrial average, and then looking at like the impacts to human systems, and then talking about strengthening the global response to the crisis because um, currently the, what's being done is not anywhere close to being enough, as we'll see a little bit later. And then the last part of the report talks about sustainable development because, of course, climate change is a threat multiplier and it basically exacerbates every other um, crisis that we're facing, such as human health and ecosystem stability and a host of other things. Um, so that's what's in the report. So a little bit about why the difference between 1.5 degrees Celsius and 2 degrees Celsius warming above pre-industrial average is important. 
Um, these are just some schematics that were put together based on the contents of the report to show a little bit about the differences. Um, and I'm going to read some of these. So the first order effects are, of course, um, we think about heat and we think about exposure to higher temperatures and what that means um, in terms of human health, in terms of it sort of shifts the entire um, realm of possible temperatures more towards the higher end, which gives us more extremes in temperature. So when we're talking about extreme heat, um, the difference under one and a half degrees of warming, 14% of the world's population would be exposed to severe heat waves at least once every five years. But under two degrees of warming, 37% of the population would be exposed to extremely severe heat waves. I mean, we can sort of see this playing out in our world today if you've seen any of the news this week about what's happening in Australia right now. It's quite horrific. Um, so holding the warming to one and a half degrees above pre-industrial baseline versus two degrees, we'd see about 420 million fewer people exposed to extreme heat waves. Um, so that's a pretty big difference. There's also implications for um, hydrologic changes. So water scarcity in a one and a half degree world versus in a two degree world, water scarcity would affect um, 350 million versus 411 million people. Um, there's also a lot of changes that are happening in the Arctic, and this is one of the places where the climate is changing more rapidly than anywhere else on the planet. One and a half degrees and two degrees, when I'm talking about that, like I said, it's the global mean surface temperature, but places are warming at rates significantly <coughs> higher than that, and the Arctic is one of those places. It's actually heating um, about two or three times quicker than other places on the planet. And what that means is permafrost melt, which is a positive feedback loop. As the permafrost melts, it releases further greenhouse gases. So the warming begets more warming. There's also the loss of sea ice cover in the Arctic, um, which is another positive feedback loop because of sea ice albedo feedback. The sea ice reflects some of the incoming solar radiation back, but when that sea ice is gone, the ocean absorbs that heat, leading um, to more heat buildup within the system. So we really do not want ice-free summers and ice-free summers are predicted to happen once every 100 years under a 1.5 degrees Celsius warmer world versus once every 10 years under a 2 degrees Celsius warmer world. So that's pretty significant. Another thing um, that's significant is sea level rise. With 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming by 2100, up to 70 million people could be exposed to flooding. Um, the difference between one and a half degrees and two degrees is the difference of 10 million um, more people being exposed to the threats of sea level rise and increased storm surge um, and inundation at the coasts. Another thing that happens between one and a half and two degrees Celsius that we haven't quite nailed down yet are tipping points within the ice sheet systems. So in the cryosphere, we know that Greenland is melting, we know that Antarctica is melting, but at some point that melt becomes um, it's just sort of catastrophic. And the implications are that sea level rise could happen quicker if we reach the tipping points. And the tipping points are thought to exist somewhere within that one and a half to two degrees Celsius range. If we lose the West Antarctic ice sheet, that's a runaway process. It's not reversible. Once it starts, it keeps going. Um, and with the inclusion of the Antarctic ice sheet into um, sea level rise estimates, if no mitigation of greenhouse gases are done, what we would see is a three foot rise in sea level before the end of this century. Um, so we really don't want that. And so the difference in sea level rise overall, um, if we were to limit warming to one and a half or two degrees, is the difference of 0.4 meters versus 0.46 meters. That doesn't sound like a lot, but again, that's 10 million more people that live within um, that range of the coast where the sea level would be rising to that amount. And of course, again, this when I'm talking about sea level rise, that's the global average. In some places, the sea level is rising quicker than in other places due to um, incredibly difficult complications within calculating sea level rise estimates around the planet, but it doesn't rise by the same amount everywhere. The ocean's not like a bathtub. Um, another thing that was included within the report is biodiversity loss. So when looking at vertebrate populations, plant populations, and insects, um, the biodiversity losses are expected to be two to three times worse with that, just that additional half degree of warming. Um, carrying along, they also looked at ecosystem impacts. Again, that's about two times worse um, with the ecosystem shifts to new biomes um, that we would see under that half a degree of warming. And the permafrost melt, as I mentioned before, another thing that starts to happen is crop yields go down under a warming climate. 
Um, and the crop yields are expected to be uh, more than two times worse under that additional half degree of warming. The coral reefs were another thing that got a lot of attention out of the report. Coral reefs um, do not do well in heat, as we've seen in the news over the last two, um, in 2016 and the summer of 2017, when we saw huge die-offs of many parts of the world's coral reefs. Under a one and a half degree warmed world above pre-industrial average, the coral reefs are expected to decline by 70 to 90 percent. These are um, species that have existed on this planet for 560 million years and we might kill them off within approximately 200 years. That's extremely bad. Um, this 70 to 90 percent decline that's expected before mid-century, so before 2050, and if the warming is not kept um, to one and a half degrees, if instead it increases to two degrees, the projections are that 99% of all coral reefs would be lost by the middle of the current century. <coughs> I apologize, but I have no good news for you. Um, so where do we stand right now? Right now we are at about one degree of warming above pre-industrial baseline. Um, so with a likely, likely range somewhere between 0 0.8 and 1.2 degrees Celsius, but around one degree we've already warmed. And the rate of warming is increasing at 0.2 degrees Celsius per decade. So if mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions is not accomplished, we're expected to hit one and a half degrees of warming somewhere between 2030 and 2050. Um, this leaves very little time to mitigate the emissions. However, the emissions that have currently happened, what's in the air right now, is not enough in and of itself to bring us to one and a half degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial baseline. So there is still time um, to stop that, but it really depends on what we do um, very quickly. Um, so this is just a plot from the report showing observed um, warming up until 2017 and then projections for one and a half degree Celsius pathways, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, um, but so the emissions that we're emitting currently, they have um, different residence times within the atmosphere. Some greenhouse gases are longer lived than others, but the CO2 is a particularly long lived gas. So it'll continue to cause warming because its residence time in the atmosphere is um, quite long, so the emissions that we're producing now can persist in the atmosphere for centuries to millennia to come. Okay, there is no safe level of warming. I just want to reiterate this. Uh, we're at one degree of warming now, and the changes that we're experiencing are not safe for many populations. We already see increases in hurricanes, increases in wildfires, increases in storm surge and sea level rise. And you don't want to conflate weather with climate. They're two different things. The weather is what we experience on a day-to-day -day basis, and the climate is the long-term average of these trends. But the things that we're experiencing now are what we expect to be experiencing in a warming world. Um, and it also, there's thermal inertia in the climate system, so it takes a while for the effects of the emissions to be felt. So the effects that we're feeling now, those are basically the effects of warming that was about 0.1 to 0.2 C lower than what we're currently at. So it takes a little bit of time for the changes to show up. The emissions that we're experiencing right now, um, the emissions that we're putting out right now, the, those changes will be propagating forward into the future. So how do we go about preventing this? In the report, what they talk about are pathways to limit the emissions to prevent one and a half degrees Celsius of warming. And they talk about these in two different ways. The first is overshoot pathways. Um, and so everything, the one and a half degrees Celsius, that's um, ending temperature at the end of 2100, so at the end of this century. Um, and so if one and a half degrees Celsius is passed sometime in the middle of the century, but comes back down before 2100, that's still considered a one and a half degrees Celsius pathway, but that requires the use of carbon dioxide removal on an extremely large scale. These things are untested and they come with a lot of disadvantages and risks um, inherent in the use of carbon dioxide removal technology. It's just untested. It has, it's best not to rely on it. Um, but those are needed in the majority of the pathways that were studied for this um, report. Only nine out of 90 different scenarios did not overshoot one and a half degrees Celsius before the end of the century um, in um, the literature. So emissions reductions are needed extremely fast. Um, the way it's discussed within the report is reductions from 2010 emission levels. And so the main conclusion was that 
the CO2 emissions need to be reduced by 45% below 2010 levels by 2030 in order to prevent there ever being overshoot within the current century. Um, so this is where that 12 years number comes from because the report was released in 2018 and they're talking about what needs to be done by 2030. Nowhere does it say that the world ends in 12 years or that after 12 years there's just no hope and there's nothing we can do. What it's saying is that if we don't elim it limit emissions enough by 2030 that one and a half degrees of warming is inevitable. One and a half degrees of warming is certainly very bad but we may very well be living with more warming than that. In fact, it's very probable that we will end up with warm, more warming than that. But so that's what the report was saying. If we limit emissions, we, if we reduce them by 45% below 2010 levels. However, emissions have risen since 2010, and they rose again last year by 3%. So if you use 2018 levels, it's a greater than 50%. 50, 50, 55% reduction that we would need to have before 2030 in order to pre prevent one and a half degrees warming. Also in these pathways we need to get to net zero emissions by the middle of the century. So we need to reduce by more than 50% within the next 12 years and reduce down to zero by 2050. Um, to, to reach the two degrees Celsius goal, the main goal of the Paris Agreement, we would only need to decline by 20% below 2010 levels by 2030 and reach net zero by 2075. But the sooner we do it, the better. Um, so we want to aim for the one and a half degrees Celsius goal, even though it seems incredibly difficult to achieve. Um, these were also talking about CO2 reductions. We also need reductions in all other greenhouse gases. So we need approximately a 35% reduction in methane. Um, we need reductions in black carbon emissions, in nitrous oxide emissions, in all sorts of different things. So there are, there's a lot more to think about, but the majority of it is coming from fossil fuel use. Um, so what is needed to reach this goal? We need a complete phase out of coal use as soon as possible, but new coal plants are currently being created. That's a really bad idea. Um, we need steep declines in fossil fuel use, dropping to zero by mid-century, like I said, and it, along with that, um, rapid increases in the deployment of renewable energy, um, like wind and solar. We also need reductions in industrial emissions. We need to move away from cement manufacture, um, because that is another source of emissions. That's about 6% of the global emissions. Um, we need to focus on ecosystem restoration, um, especially by the coastlines. That would be really helpful um, for countering and adapting to sea level rise. We need adaptation alongside mitigation. So mitigation is the reduction of emissions. And adaptation is the fact that we're acknowledging that we are going to be dealing with the effects of climate change. And so we need to adapt to be able to respond so that people can um, live with minimal impacts to their lives. So we have to have adaptive measures. Um, alongside mitigation. <coughs> so this is a very ambitious goal and it requires international cooperation. It requires very large scale action. Um, but the challenges that we face, they're not necessarily technological. We could do this technologically speaking. The challenges are political and economic, um, which I'm sure you're all used to. Um, <laughs> so where do we stand currently? Um, global action is currently wholly insufficient. Um, this plot shows projected warming, that's the gray, by the end of 2100. We are projected to warm, if we do not reduce emissions at all, somewhere between 4 and 5 degrees Celsius. So completely blowing past um, the actual goals. The current pledges, so I don't know if you guys know um, a little bit about how the Paris Agreement works, but under the Paris Agreement, countries are allowed to determine their own contributions. Um, this is to ensure some countries are more responsible for what has happened than others. Some countries are bearing a disproportionate um, amount of the risks and didn't contribute as much to the actual emissions themselves. So countries can, um, can state what their own goals are going to be, and countries that have had high historic emissions should have higher reductions. So like the United States and Britain um, and Canada um, need to have better proposals. So, the countries have started submitting their nationally determined contribution um, proposals saying what they will do. And if all of the current proposals are perfectly implemented, we would reach three degrees to three and a half degrees of warming by the end of the century. So the proposals need to be stepped up and they need to be stepped up substantially. Um, and then you can see those yellow and green lines. Those are the ones we want. And then the blue line.
lines, those are the ones that are currently we're on track for with the Paris Agreement, and the gray line again is if we do absolutely nothing. Okay, this is another way of looking at that. This is from the Paris Equity Check. Um, it's a website, you can go on it, it's really great. Um, it sort of tracks what the country's contributions are and um, how close we are to meeting the Paris goal. You cannot read that little bar probably, but what it says is the countries in red, if their proposal is followed, it would lead to a five degrees of warming by the end of the century. The ones in orange, that's like a three to four degrees amount of warming is what their proposal would lead to. The ones in green, those are the ones that actually have proposals that would keep the warming to one and a half degrees. So you can see there's, um, there's, it's very clear who needs to step up their proposals more than others. Um, it's kind of what you expect. Um, but yeah, this is um, free, it is a website you can go to at any time. So strengthening the global response, that's included in the report. And what they talk about in the UN report is that we need systemic change across all sectors of society. So that includes energy, industry, transportation, and agriculture, forestry, and land use. Um, responses need to include mitigation as well as adaptation, like I said before. And we need to talk about like feasibility, like is something environmentally feasible? Is it technologically feasible? Um, is it geophysically possible? And so some examples that are given within the report of mitigation strategies are of course like increasing renewable energy in installations, decrease industrialized emissions and um, cement use, an increase in mass transit and a move away from air travel. We don't really have um, a good, that there's no real preventing the air travel emissions. There's not really an alternative to that that doesn't include emissions. So a move, a shift um, towards much more limited air travel is gonna be needed. Um, we also need increases in energy efficiency in regards to heating, cooling, appliances, things like that. Um, increased public transportation and um, a lower use of like individual fossil fueled passenger transport vehicles and a move towards like having um, city and community structures where it's more, um, it's, it's more, it's easier to be able to walk or bike where you're going or take public transportation. Um, we also need a move towards plant-based diets. Um, <coughs> livestock emissions are quite high and there aren't really any pathways um, towards meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement without a move largely away from um, meat and dairy. Um, so that's included in there. Um, as far as adaptation goes, protection for people um, from the heat, especially workers that have jobs that are primarily outside, such as agricultural workers. We need protection um, for them from like um, from heat stress um, because that's a real problem. We need flood protection for people who are living by the coasts or in places that are vulnerable to flooding. Um, we need urban parks because, um, like I said, warming happens differentially. Um, cities are heat islands because they have so much asphalt and it, it absorbs the heat. So cities are generally much higher in temperature than surrounding forested areas. Um, so one of the things that was mentioned in the report that could be an adaptive strategy is to have more um, urban parks to promote greening of our cities um, and green roofs and things like that. Forestry protection um, is really important and as well as wetland restoration. Um, so those are a few of the ideas that are included in the report. They also note that risks of course differ by populations. Um, so there are populations that are disproportionately higher risk of adverse consequences, and these include um, traditionally disadvantaged and vulnerable populations, um, indigenous peoples, um, communities that are developed, um, that are reliant on um, agricultural or coastal um, livelihoods are more at risk. Um, regions that are at a disproportionately higher risk are the Arctic, like I mentioned earlier, the Arctic is changing more rapidly than anywhere else on the planet. Um, dryland regions and regions that are prone to drought, um, those are at an extremely high risk. And small island nations, because they are very, um, very low above sea level, in some cases only several inches above sea level, and um, many island nations are expected to be completely submerged before the end of the century, which of course has implications for human migration. Um, and so poverty and disadvantages are expected to increase in different populations. Um, Global warming is a threat multiplier for all of these things. 
Um, and so they talk about needing to take into account the fact that climate change exacerbates poverty, but the solutions to climate change can counter poverty. If they're well thought out and well implemented, then the solutions to climate change can actually help reduce poverty, but they have to be well thought out. Um, and so they were talking about the United Nations development goals, um, such as like increasing health, increasing access to education, um, gender equality, um, clean water, um, sanitation, all of these things are threatened by climate change, but can be um, helped as long as social justice um, and equitable solutions are core aspects of the resilient development. So when we're talking adaptation, when we're talking mitigation, we have to center the most disadvantaged <coughs> populations and make sure that our solutions are not exacerbating any problems, but are in fact helping people. So that's my first part. Uh, any questions so far? <laughs> you want to take questions? Do you have any questions so far on that? What just happened? Yeah. We all are familiar with the the options for CO two emissions. You know, the solar panels and all that. I've never heard of an option for cement. For what? Cement. Cement. Oh. Well, right. Yeah. Exactly. I'm not a specialist in building materials, but I feel like that's one for the engineers. I feel like someone must have ideas for alternatives to cement, and it's just not something that I've spent a ton of time thinking about, so I'm sorry that I don't have a, di a direct answer to that one, but you know, we will need alternatives for sure. I know that somebody is, work is doing a workshop on hempcrete. I don't know any specifics, but maybe hemp is an alternative to hemp. Yes. Hi, you didn't mention uh, the capture of heat in the oceans, which recent studies have said yeah. make all of this like heat absorption warmth. in the oceans is um, the oceans are taking up most of the heat that is happening right now, which of course is another contributing factor to sea level rise because as the ocean heats up, it expands. As the ocean heats up, it also creates a lot of stress um, for the populations of animals um, that live within the ocean. It's it's bad overall. Um, but the only way to really counter it is to reduce emissions. Yes. Thinking our forest scanning doesn't cost anything and has a triple benefit for the climate. Yes. <laughs> yes, we should not be we should not be getting rid of forests. <laughs> this is also kind of this is sort of ground zero in Massachusetts because we have a lot of the, the worst logging. Yeah. This, yeah. And Brazil for sure. Yeah. Um, the Amazon is, is quite threatened at this moment, especially with the new fascist leader installed. Yes. 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 I wonder if you could just say something more specific about the current state of the feedback loops that are already in play, and if there's any way to kind of be more specific about, okay, once we get a certain level of temperature rise, that's kind of it. Yeah, so this is actually one of the current areas of research that many scientists are focusing on because we don't have it quite nailed down what the exact amount of warming where these tipping points are reached are. So there are a lot of different kinds of feedback loops. There is um, the Arctic sea ice, there is um, the permafrost melt. There are lots of different feedbacks and we're just unsure at this point. So people are, that's a huge within the literature right now is like at which point these are reached. And there's a lot of, I didn't really talk about uncertainties, but there are a lot of uncertainties in the system and one of those is climate sensitivity. We don't actually know what climate sensitivity is and climate sensitivity is what degree of warming is expected for every doubling of CO2. So it could be anywhere from one and a half degrees to four and a half degrees. So even the warming itself is uncertain to some extent. Um, and so we have uncertainties in when the feedbacks, um, how bad they could get, how quickly. And new research suggests that it might be happening quicker than we think it's happening. Um, permafrost felt melt is accelerating quicker than we thought it would. Antarctic melt is accelerating quicker than we thought it would. Um, yeah. Yeah. Could you just speak for a, a minute about um, the amount of sequestration with trees as they get older? Because we're facing an area where 80 acres of, of 100 year old plus oaks are, are being maybe cut down. Yeah, we should we should definitely avoid cutting those down. Um, I don't have exact numbers for the carbon sequestration. Yeah. I can, well, just okay. one thing that I, Bill Muma, um, who's worked a lot with the IPCC, 
Um, I saw I was at a talk with him last week, and he was saying that the oldest 1% of trees sequester half the carbon, so it's really important to allow the forest to grow and to maintain the older forests. <coughs> what we're doing now is just basically cutting every, but you know, 40, 50 years, and those newer trees just they don't really do much as far as compared to the, the old growth. Yeah, it takes a while. The development is slow. Yeah. Can you speak about the, uh, the methane hydrate coming out of the Arctic Ocean? Um, that's um, another one of the feedback loops. Um, so that there are times in the Earth's past, um, what we do to try to project changes in the future is reconstruct changes in the past. And methane hydrates are thought to be the cause of some of the more rapid climate um, shifts that have happened in the past, and not under anthropogenic greenhouse gas forcing. But um, that's another one of the things where it could, it could reach a point where, um, and it's irreversible, um, but it could reach a point where that releases a ton of additional greenhouse gases quite rapidly. And again, it's something where we don't know exactly where that threshold point is. Um, but it is probably, um, it, it's a pretty big risk at this moment. And really the only thing we can do about any of those things is to limit greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, Japan was able to um, separate the methane from the methane hydrate, but oh. they didn't do it in a commercially viable way. Do you ever see? I didn't see that. That was maybe three, four years ago, I think. Two, three, four years ago. Yeah, I don't remember seeing the news about that, but okay. that sounds like an interesting line of research. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, what about um, computational stuff? So if everybody gets a cell phone, everybody has a computer, everybody's got a TV, and they're streaming things, is that are, are those impacts are inherent in the other categories of analysis, or is that a separate thing? Yeah. So like. Like the the, the resource of, use that goes into making our all of our technology, making it and sustaining it, using energy, energy. yeah, yeah, and that's all incorporated into these things, into the projections that I've been talking about. I mean, is that an area energy. where we should look to really you know, reduce for usage? individuals? Yeah. That's so for individuals, um, there was a study yeah. that was released. Either a year and a half ago um, by Wins and Nichols that looked at impactful um, actions amongst individuals and found that um, there's a pretty wide discrepancy between the ones that we think are impactful and the ones that are actually impactful. So when we talk about like turning off light bulbs to save energy or switching to more energy efficient light bulbs, that's all good things to do, but it's pretty low at, at on the level of impact within the system. So the most impactful things as far as individual behaviors um, relate to air travel, car travel, and meat consumption. Um, those are the three things that make the biggest difference on an individual level, far more than energy efficiency and things of that nature. Yes, next. So, so you talked about um, the whole need for a more global collaboration to yeah. reduce emissions. Um, it does seem to me there is a problem uh, if you're going to cut air travel and you know and somehow energy use that is involves communication on various sorts. Uh, for example, you, you, I don't even know if you're thinking about broadband to rural communities or whatever that increases energy use. I mean, we need some kind of the global communications, whether it's in person or yes. energy communications, in order to reduce the emissions. Yes. But if they're contributing. You know, there's this trade-off problem, right? So what's happening within the climate science community is climate scientists are trying to model different behaviors um, that we want in terms of communication um, because a lot of climate science is done across borders and we have collaborations that are global and international. And so, and, and there's also conferences. So like if 20 or 40,000 scientists all need to attend one conference and it's in a given area, what we're trying to push for is to have those mostly be virtual so that people don't have to use the emissions to actually travel, but to make use of things like, um, like teleconferencing so that we can reduce um, transport emissions. So for instance, 
at the last um, scientific conference I attended, there was a big move to have participants not fly, but instead take train travel, and then to use that to talk about how we don't have very good public transport or rail options. And so by the scientists all saying, hey, we want to take the train. Other people want to take the train. We need better trains. Like, we have to make it feasible within our society for people to make these transitions, but as far as travel goes, um, switching to teleconferencing is really much, much better and far less energy intensive than moving people place to place. Hugh, then you. Um, I know and there are a lot of reasons um, why people um, have issues with it, but I'm always stunned by the absence of population as a discussion in any of these Issues. I should have actually mentioned that one because that was the um, in the Wins and Nichols study that I was talking about with the impactful um, actions was um, one of the first ones was family planning. Um, so that requires access to reproductive care um, and that requires people to be able to have control over their bodies and control over access to reproductive care um, for all individuals. And so yeah, population is a big one, um, but resource distribution um, is even bigger. So we have part of the population that's using far more resources than everyone else. But population um, population growth is a big thing that we do need to consider as well. What, why don't we go on to the other part and then there'll be some time okay. for questions after. Sorry. All right, a little bit about Massachusetts. Here we go, temperature trends in Massachusetts. So like I mentioned, not all places are warming at the same rate. Um, and Massachusetts is actually um, warming quicker than other regions, we are already at 1.3 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial baseline here. Um, so not the one degree that we have for the global mean surface temperature, but we're at 1.3 here in Massachusetts. Right now, this is data from NOAA um, going from 1895 to 2017. Um, there is, um, there are also precipitation shifts that are going to happen. A warmer atmosphere holds more moisture. It, has a greater um, increased risk of heavy precipitation events. So um, we can see this playing out, and like I said before, weather is not climate, but what we're experiencing now is what we expect to experience under a changing climate. 2018 was the second year, second wettest year on record for the town of Massachusetts, and the record keeping goes back to the 1800s. We the had a Amherst. lot. <coughs> the town of Amherst? For the town of Amherst. We have, um, yeah. We had a lot of rain this past year. And another thing, um, so I included a plot specifically of climate projections for Franklin County. This is information that is freely and publicly available on the internet on resilientma.org. Um, um, so this is looking at total precipitation um, projected forward towards the end of this century. And of course, it is increasing. Um, so we're looking at an increase of like, um, two inches to four inches of rain per year um, by the end of the century, um, more than what we already um, are experiencing. Another thing, um, looking again at Franklin County and looking at projections for temperatures at the high and low end of the temperature ranges. Um, so we'll be experiencing more heat waves and um, this is quantified in looking at the annual number of days where the maximum temperatures would exceed 95 degrees um, Fahrenheit, not Celsius this time, just going to make that distinction. Um, we don't want a 95 degrees Celsius. Um, so this is looking at, it could be anywhere from 10 up to, at the high end of the modeled um, realm, up to 70 days um, where we would be experiencing greater than 95 degree temperatures by the end of the century. But the median here is somewhere between, between 10 and 20 days per year where it would be greater than 95 degrees Celsius. I don't do super well in the heat. I don't want this. Could, um, you, could you just tell us the titles of those? It's hard to see. Annual days with maximum temperature above 95 degrees Celsius for Franklin County. That is on the left. On the right here, we have annual days with minimum temperature below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So we will have an increase in hot days and a decrease in cold days. Um, and so one of the ways that this is going to play out for us here is with um, shifts, and we're expecting global precipitation shifts away from rain and towards snow, I mean away from snow and towards rain. Um, so we would be expected to have um, fewer snowstorms in the winter, and of course snowpack is important for many things such as like maple production for instance. Um, so we would be experiencing more rainstorms in the winter and fewer snowstorms or more sleet um, because the temperatures would not be expected to get 
cold enough for um, snow to occur as often um, projected into the future. Um, so progress in Massachusetts, we're actually making progress here um, at a quicker rate than in most places within the US. Um, so Massachusetts is responsible for about 1.2% of the nation's greenhouse gas emissions, and we have the Global Warming Solutions Act, um, which calls for emissions reductions of 25% below 1990 levels by 2020, so that's coming up quick, but we are pretty much on track. Um, we've already reduced by 21%, and that's what this graph is showing here. This is Massachusetts um, greenhouse gas emissions, and that blue is um, the actual emissions, that green dot, I don't know if you can see it, but that's the goal point, and so the blue is converging towards the green, that's good. Um, so we are making some progress here, and we had the House bill last year that um, is predicted to expand the share of renewables um, by 2030, um, but of course it was a watered down version that ended up passing and we could do better. Um, so, but since there's already a move towards action in Massachusetts, that's a good thing because we can push for more action. Um, Another way of looking at emissions in Massachusetts, um, this plot on the left is how Massachusetts energy is generated. Um, so between 2001 and 2017, and what you see there in orange is an increase in natural gas. Uh, this, this time is moving forward to the right here. Um, so at 2017, natural gas was about 66% of the electricity generation, and that's how um, a lot of the reason that the emissions decreases on the previous slide are being achieved is by moving towards natural gas, which is lower emitting, but it's still emitting. Um, yeah, yeah, fracking. It's it's not good. Um, but what you think? Blows up neighborhoods. Yes, it does. Um, so we need to be moving away from natural gas. Like, yes, it has accomplished us some emissions reductions, but we don't want to be reliant on it going forward. We need to get rid of it. Um, and so we need to move towards renewable electricity generation um, and away from natural gas as well as away from coal and oil. Um, on the right here is Massachusetts greenhouse gas emissions by sector. You definitely can't read that from there, so I'm going to read it to you. In um, the panel on the left, that's in, the Mass in Massachusetts. The panel on the right is for the U.S. as a whole. The purple is transportation. The dark blue above it is residential. Um, the light blue above that is commercial. Then we have green is industrial and orange is other. So what you can see there is that 41% of the emissions um, by sector in Massachusetts are coming from transportation. So transportation gives us um, an opportunity to decrease emissions um, by moving towards public transport, by making it easier for people to be able to take bikes or walk places, um, by moving towards electric vehicles, um, though electric vehicles are still not as good as walking or biking. So to figure out what to do, we need to know why action has not happened. Um, and the reason action has not happened sooner, even though we've known that climate change is a problem for decades now, we've known the science of this, um, but the reason that action isn't happening is related to the political and economic spheres. So we have far too much lobbying. We have um, campaign finance issues, as you are all well aware. Um, we have think tanks, um, conservative think tanks, that end up having a lot of um, influence, even uh, influence over writing and drafting of legislation. Um, we have industry-funded denialism, which has um, taken a huge toll on um, public uh, opinion towards climate change. Um, we have a revolving door between lobbyists, industry, and the government, and we have massive fossil fuel subsidies on the order of $20 billion per year in the US alone, $1 trillion if you consider the entire world. So that, of course, keeps us locked into fossil fuels. Um, and this is the blog post I wrote. This is why we can't have What does that things. mean? What are fossil fuel subsidies? What is that? So that can, be, that can be anything from direct subsidies. It can be cheap land leases that allow extraction of fossil fuels on um, public lands. Um, it can be um, subsidies at the pump. It can be all sorts of different things. There's a wide range of fossil fuel subsidies. But it's, it's things that keep, keep fossil fuels as, as our dominant energy source. Um, so action that we need, um, we need legislation moving us towards net zero emissions by mid-century, but as soon as possible would be really great. Um, we need expansions of public transportation. We need to have no new fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, so every bit of fossil fuel infrastructure that is created that locks us into additional emissions because people want to 
the companies that are creating these want to protect their investments. So every new piece of infrastructure keeps us dependent on the current system. Um, we need to have support for the inquiries into Exxon and Shell because they were defrauding the public and spreading denialism and that that has fed back on what we've done. So it's great that Maura Healy is leading that charge here in Massachusetts against Exxon. Um, we need to have political candidates refuse money from the fossil fuel industry. Um, we need the will of the people to be what's dominant in creating policy and not the role of um, corporations. Um, we need to end subsidies and we need so many more different things. Um, this is a quote from Val Masalda Monti. She was one of the um, people that was a lead contributor to the IPCC report. Um, and she's talking about um, the risks of relying on net negative emissions and the and how we really need to reduce emissions and not be reliant on this idea that maybe sometime in the future we'll be able to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. We need to just reduce the emissions now. Um, this was just a group of people that was in support of the idea of a Green New Deal put forward by the Sunrise Movement. Can you go back to that for one second and yes. say who's missing? Yes, Neil is missing. No. Oh, he's missing. No. Yeah. Um, so, call his office. <laughs> it's, it's a situation. Um, so, climate change presents a challenge, but it also presents an opportunity. So, the future under heavy greenhouse gas emissions, under high temperature rises, it doesn't look great. And it isn't great because it's extremely detrimental to humans, to non-humans, and to ecosystem health as a whole. Um, so, but our response to it can help us build a better future. So we need to act quickly, but we need to act in really well thought out ways. We need to make sure that we're doing the right things, reducing our emissions, and also adapting to the changes that we're already experiencing. Um, our responses need to be based in science and in social justice. So we need to make sure that this transition is just and is equitable. Um, the special report cautions that if if responses are not well thought out, if they are poorly done, that can create bigger risks for us. Um, so, and it could lead to wasted time. It could lead to compounded issues. So, we need to make sure that the things that we're going to be doing are the things that are scientifically and socially going to be the most helpful. Is that yeah? This is the references that I used in this. I can send that to you. This is my contact information if you want to. Follow me on the internet. Um, yeah, there you go. So we have time for a little bit more in the way of questions, and then we'll talk to us very briefly about the CPR Climate Task Force. Yeah, I want to hear about it. So. In the back. Hi. Which one um, the so can people stand up, please, so we can hear you? And talk loud. I read a summary of the report that recommended converting, like, I don't know, two-thirds of our grazing land to um, building, uh, to planting forests. Can you speak about that? So yeah, grazing land is a pretty significant problem. Um, and there, there are a ton of problems inherent in animal agriculture, and one of them is the, the fact that it takes, it's highly, highly resource intensive in terms of land, water use, um, land use for the crops that then go to feed the animals. So yeah, we do need to have um, pasture land be moved towards something that's much more helpful. Was that one of the recommendations? Yeah. Is that one of the recommendations of the report? Yeah, did you read the summary for policymakers? Um, I, it was in some Boston thing. I don't remember. Oh, okay. But um, yeah. Yeah, yeah like the report does talk a little bit about pasture land. Um, and the idea was that the, the forest would then <coughs> absorb a lot of carbon and get us back to where we wanted to be. Yeah, so so planting forests, that's the only proven safe way to do CO2 removal. Um, the technological advancements for pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere um, are much sketchier, but planting forests is like a natural way to draw down CO2. Um, it's, sorry, I didn't hear you, but, um, but yeah, so, so that is a good idea, but it needs, the emissions reductions need to be, um, need to be really centered because if we're still emitting and we planted forests, we still don't have 
um, we're still never going to draw down enough. And person next to you. Hi, thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome. It caused me a lot of anxiety. I had to leave my body. Same. But um, <laughs> one thing I did notice is you said Richie Neal was not on that list. That's true. And so I know that you're not. Um, this isn't like your specialty, but what do you suggest for citizens in addition to moving towards plant-based diets and doing individual things? What do you suggest is the most comprehensive and effective way for us to go to our representatives and bring them information that will push them effectively in the direction to represent what we need to make these changes at a government level? Yeah, I think we need a really clear ask. So I think we need um, to develop like a clear proposal in line with what the science says is recommended and bring that to them. Um, and Would you help us do that? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm happy to help though, yeah. Like I live um, in Neil's district, so I'm happy to go down to his office and tell him how I feel. How many people here live in Richie Neal's district? Quite a few. So. How many people are willing to go to Richie Neal's district? Sunshine movement. CPR has uh, begun developing a coalition of groups in Neal's district to pressure him, not specifically on climate, but on a range of issues. So, yes. Is, is there a way to get the um, learn what are the um, important solutions, kind of region by region? And with the example of the forest question, I think, um, for example, out in the Midwest where there's a lot of open cropland, maybe that's a place where you would target that. But here, we're right. two thirds forested and lots of development and stuff. And so it's not we're not overrun with pastures necessarily. Yes. But how can we find out which of these things make the most sense? Yeah, and that is right extremely here. important. The, the challenges faced um, by each individual area are distinct, um, so challenge, so solutions need to be community-based based on what we have here. Um, I would refer you to the um, National Climate Assessment that came out just like, um, like a, a couple weeks after the special report came out, and that um, is very clearly breaks down regionally within the U.S. what is happening um, and what the challenges faced by each region are. Um, so I would recommend looking that up. It's another um, resource that is freely available on the internet. Um, it's just National Climate Assessment. Um, just Google that and you'll be able to see it has all of that information clearly broken down by region. Yes. Um, I hope, I, I pray, I hope that you have a, a sheet available or cards or something with web pages and your you said you have a web page or your I have a website and I just started a blog um uh -huh. about possible like that. Um, and I have Twitter and Instagram where I post this information. But as far as a handout, I am going to get that done. I did not get it done before coming here. Um, because I, my research is about to be published, and I'm uh, kind of, I'm really tired. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's, been, it's been a long trudge to get to that point. Um, but yeah, I will be getting you guys um, a sheet of resources, um, things that I referenced in the talk, some of the main figures and points, so that you can refer back to it and find these things online. You're and welcome. we can post that on our website, yeah. and we'll send links in the next couple of newsletters. Yeah, other person. What, what, can you go back to your contact? Oh, I should go back to your contact. Okay, yeah, this is how to reach me. I'm at Science Channel on Instagram and Twitter. Um, that's my email. This is my website. Um, my blog is up on Medium. Um, you can get to it from any of the other places. And it currently, I just started it in January, so it only has that one post about this is why we can't have nice things. It's looking at um, some of the political and economic things that have happened in last November and December. I was like, I'm just going to write one big rant about Could all Could you this. read the website, please? Sciencechaina.com. And mostly what's on it right now is like my CV and my um, teaching schedule. <laughs> my, uh, my social medias are probably better. But um, oh, and these were some suggestions. Uh, 
I think it's important to follow climate scientists and climate news on social media to stay informed. And so these were some of my favorites, Inside Climate News, which is based in Boston, and they do some really amazing climate reporting. Um, so really do follow them. Um, climate Central is another good one, and Carbon Brief is another good one um, that's not on there. Um, you can also follow the IPCC, because they tweet about the reports. And you can follow the authors of this report, like that tweet that I took a screenshot of, um, Val um, Hassan Del Monte. She posts lots of really great information about the IPCC. But I can give you a list of suggestions of where to go for more information and things along those lines, if that's helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, person standing up, then you guys, then you guys. Uh, thanks again. Oh, you're welcome. Um, do you have any good reference for a sort of life cycle of foods? Because I'm hearing yes, a lot I of... Do. I, I, I hear a lot of sort of... Uh, on once, you know, yeah. categorical decisions, we should be all plant-based. But I think of the impact of a, a, a vegan family with five kids drinking copious amounts of almond milk. Yeah. And yeah. we live in Massachusetts, where almonds don't grow. <laughs> so and they I are an enormous amount of water. I think specifically on just yeah. food and climate. I give entire hour-long lectures just on that topic, so I actually have all of those answers and all of those resources. Um, the emissions from um, from dairy milks are far higher than those from almond milks or soy milks or anything of that nature. The emissions, um, but, I, I um, but yeah, it's, recently it's been found that I don't know if it's been implemented in the seaweed. In uh, dairy or livestock, okay, feedstock, can reduce their methane emission by 70 percent, right. and so that would that be great to implement that. Uh, but the other thing is, I want to I want to encourage people to to think with the full picture because we, we have to be living where we live, and so we have to you know recognize that in Massachusetts it's possible that there are food sources that make more sense, it makes perhaps more sense to eat eggs than it does to eat avocados, you know? <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, there is, um, a, the, one of the best resources for this is um, the most comprehensive life cycle analysis study was put out by Paul and Nimic Um It came out last summer. Um, and it looked at like just a huge sweeping array of life cycle analyses. So like from production, um, growing the food, to transporting the food, to packaging the food, to refrigerating it into the grocery store, to you driving to the grocery store, to the actual end, um, to like food waste as well. It incorporates that all in. And um, the, the results are, are really clear that, um, especially for transport emissions, food miles, um, it's much better to eat food locally. However, what you eat, the type of food, matters far, far more from an emission standpoint than where it comes from. So for instance, within, within vegetable production, the emissions are concentrated in the transportation phase. But even vegetables that are shipped in from another continent have lower emissions than eating animal-based products. Um, and so, <laughs> When it, it's more important to buy your vegetables locally um, than to, so you can reduce emissions from vegetables by buy, buying them locally. However, the emissions from animal agriculture, the seaweed study, I've read that one, um, it's the emissions that are achieved through that um, don't get us far, actually, because someone asks this every time, um, I actually have, um, and it's a really good question, so I'm glad you asked it. I included a slide in here um, that's about the Paris Agreement goals and dietary guidelines. Um, so just going through this real quick, that gray bar all the way to the right, that's the two degrees Celsius um, temperature goal. That's, um, that's, the emissions that, that's the emissions budget for two degrees Celsius. The shorter gray bar, that's the emissions budget for 1.5 degrees Celsius. And these other multicolored bars, they are various um, dietary guideline emissions. Um, so what's important here is that um, these are for different countries. And the USA is the one next to the short little bar. Um, and so these are based on dietary guidelines. And then the, um, the two shortest ones, those are in India. 
And then the ones over to this end are those that are from life cycle analysis studies of um, the World Health Organization recommended diet. And so these gray bars, that those carbon budgets, those are including all sectors. So that's including energy, transportation, food. That's our total carbon budget to stay within the one and a half or two degree goals. You can see that under every diet that was considered in the study, and these are the diets of the US, Australia, China, Canada, Germany, and India, and the World Health Organization, we bypass the one and a half degree goal on food emissions alone, even if we assume a total decarbonization of all other sectors of society, if um, diets don't change significantly. And so what you're seeing here in green, that's dairy emissions, and then above that, including life cycle analysis um, production to consumption. Um, the blues and browns, those are meat products, and then the red and lower, the red, yellow, and blue at the bottom, those are plant-based foods. Um, so without significant reductions in the quantity consumed, we still cannot achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement, and then in terms of transportation of animal products, um, locally grown animal products versus animal products that are um, shipped in, because the production emissions from enteric fermentation are so, so high, the transport actually adds very little to the emissions from meat products. Um, so, and also, uh, another study that came out last summer showed that grass-fed beef, because of the efficiencies inherent within their di the cow's digestive systems, the grass-fed beef actually has 43% higher methane emissions than feedlot-based meat. So it's, it's actually fairly substantial. A lot of these things, grass-fed, organic, those are marketing. That's, that's marketing to try to get consumers to feel better about purchasing a specific product. But if you're talking specifically about emissions, that's it's not good. Um, and I wish I had, I have it on my computer, but not on this computer. I can show you afterwards if you want um, the life cycle assessment analysis for a whole range of different foodstuffs. Um, I have all of that data on my computer from giving my other lectures. But you can see pretty clearly when you look at it that the, the bars for plant-based foods are like this and the bars for animal-based foods are like Yep, yep, and there's another paper that came out in October that looked at um, water uses, land usage, eutrophication, um, and a host of other varieties. And the only way to really stay within planetary guidelines is to significantly reduce, and if you are able to, elimination is um, even better than reduction. Yeah. 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 The So, um, if Shana is willing, I'm going to ask her if she can stay for a little bit after. I don't know if you can. I not. probably can. I have a bunch of stuff okay. that's due to my advisors tomorrow morning. We're not going to make morning, you do this. But, um, Okay, um, we do have some other things we really want to get to, but before we transition, um, CPR has a climate crisis task force. It's one of our, our major work groups. A group of us actually went this week to the State House and participated in a climate lobby day organized by Mass Power Forward, which is a, the, it's the largest climate coalition. It's a coalition of about 150 organization, CPR is one of them. Um, but I wanted to ask Bob if he could, if he would chairs our climate task force, if you could just say a few words ab about the task force. And one of the things we're hoping to do is really, and this I think is going to help a lot, figure out, okay, there's a million things we can do, right? But given who we are and what our capacity is and where we live, what are the most effective things that we can do? But let me turn it over to Bob for a few minutes. So before the meeting starts, why don't we give Shane a big hand? <laughs> 